welcome to the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography podcast. My name is Dr. Amar Jori, and it is my pleasure to present the final episode in our summer 2021 series. For this final episode, I wanted to make sure it was very special. And so I invited my friend, Dr. Jose Banks here. And uh, we also have Dr. David Masuka Zatuin from currently practicing in Canada, who will be talking about his paper, The Prognostic Value of Peak Exercise Systolic Pulmonary Arterial Pressure in Asymptomatic Primary Mitral Valve Regurgitation, which appears in the September 2021 issue of the Journal of the American Society of Echo. Dr. Banks, how are you doing today? Good, Amr. How are Good. you? I'm Thank very you. delighted to have you uh, join us. Um, I know you previously had some uh, feedback for the uh, podcast, and I uh, took your feedback to heart and tried to make it better. What are, what are your thoughts? Is it is it running better? <laughs> I I think uh, I love it. I I'm a big fan from the get go, and. Uh, I think your new format and the conversation and the guests uh, panel has been very, uh, very welcoming, very warm, uh, very high quality. I'm very impressed and I uh, applaud it all the way. I'm very happy with it. Thank the you. Podcast. And I hope I hope you can join us on some more future episodes. I, I, I always enjoy uh, chatting with you. Um, and I, I know you've recently had a move and so you've been busy and haven't been able to join us previously. Can you tell us about where you're located and a little bit about your practice now? Sure. Um, as you know, I used to be in Houston. I was living uh, in the city by the Met Center, and I was the director of the Echo Lab at UT MD Anderson for about 12 years, um, uh, 10 years in the Echo Lab uh, director position. And then um, opportunity came uh, from Colorado, and now I'm uh, here at the, at the University of Colorado in the Aurora, uh, Denver area, and uh, director of the Ecolab here as well. That's wonderful. It sounds like a, a, a nice move for you and a nice change. That's great. Yeah. Um, I also remember that uh, you recently won an award through the American Society of Echo, and I was really pleased to see that. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, actually, that's funny you mentioned that because today I walk into the office that I'm moving and uh, uh, as opposed to uh, enjoying a very nice uh, view of the Rockies to my right, the most prominent thing in the office today was this big package and uh, it was the award, the award wow. that came in the mail. The, that's beautiful. Uh, uh, so tell us about this award. That's yeah, wonderful. So they, uh, they honored me. Uh, I'm very humbled to say uh, the ASC has a meritorious service award. And uh, this past year in the uh, virtual scientific sessions, uh, I was the recipient. And it came with this and, and a book that I just, put, I just put here. And I'm very happy uh, with the pictures and uh, and Dr. Swaminathan and Judy Hung's uh, uh, note on it, uh, very 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 moving, very kind. Uh, I got to bring it in person. They said to bring it in person to the next, to, so they can people actually can sign it. So that's uh, incredible. I was so happy to hear about you getting the award. I you know I had the opportunity to interact with you at numerous ASC meetings and planning sessions and. I've always enjoyed your company and your ideas and your innovation. So very well deserved. Congratulations from everyone. <laughs> Likewise. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, David, uh, wonderful to have you on board as well. So um, I understand that you've uh, previously practiced in France. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. It's very intriguing, uh, your career pathway as well. Okay, uh, so first, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I've been born and trained in uh, Paris, uh, first in Tonon and then in uh, Bichat Hospital with uh, Alec Vanian. Uh, all my training has been dedicated to echo and valvular heart disease. Uh, I've been also fortunate to spend two years at the Mayo Clinic uh, with uh, Maurice Serrano. 
uh, from 2001 to 2003, long time ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I was in Paris up to 2018, and I moved to Ottawa in 2000, January 2018, so almost uh, three years and a half. And I'm uh, still continuing working on valvular heart disease. Great. So you're at the Ottawa Heart Institute currently? Yes. yes. Okay, Correct. wonderful. And you have a particular passion for valvular heart disease is what I keep hearing from you. Yes. <laughs> and this paper we are discussing is also about valve. Uh, so uh, I was appointed to develop valvular heart disease at the Ottawa Heart Institute. And we have created a center for valvular heart disease now, which gives us a, a clinic, uh, the CLIP team, the tablet team, and other colitis team. That's wonderful. Great. Uh, congratulations on the publication of this work uh, in, the, in the most recent our, uh, journal uh, uh, issue. What I'm going to do is let you take it from there mm -hmm. um, and share your screen and present to us your most recent work. Okay, you see the slides? Yes. Okay, so it's a work I have done in uh, Paris uh, before leaving uh, regarding the prognostic value of uh, peak exercise systolic pulmonary pressure in patients with uh, mature exudation. So the lead author was uh, uh, one of my former uh, fellow, uh, Dimitri Arangalaj. So the rationale for the study is that when you have severe mature exudation, symptoms, AFib, LV dysfunction or dilatation, or uh, elevated systolic pulmonary pressure at rest, management is easy. Patients need to be sent for an intervention. When you are in sinus prism with no symptoms and normal EF and normal LV size, management is more debated. And we have indirect evidence that uh, maybe in some selected patient, we should intervene earlier. So the rationale of the study is to identify patients that may benefit the most of having an early intervention. And for that, we have evaluated what was the additional prognostic value of systolic pulmonary artery pressure during exercise in patients with asymptomatic degenerative matter regulation in sinus rhythm and uh, with preserved EF. So it's a retrospective study. We have collected 177 patients with significant MR. Etiology was degenerative in all patients. Patient has preserved EF. No, uh, not um, normal LV size. They were all in sinus prism and they were sent for a clinically indicated exercise test. So all patients had a rest exercise echo. They have exercise tests in two parts, so it's the same, but we divided in two parts. First was a, the exercise test it, itself and we did also the exercise echo at the same time and we record LV uh, size and function and systolic pulmonary pressure. And patients were followed, or we collected the outcome more correctly. And uh, outcome is mainly if the patient develops an indication for an intervention or a sudden death. Uh, this table is quite busy, uh, but we first uh, divided the population in patients with normal exercise test and abnormal exercise test. When you have abnormal exercise test, it's a class one indication for intervention. So we have 26 patients that were referred for an intervention. Uh, and we have 151 patients that have a normal exercise test. Among this 151, some have elevated systolic pulmonary pressure during the exercise, more than 60, which was previously uh, indicated in the guidelines. We have 30 patients and 131 patients have normal exercise test and no uh, systolic pulmonary pressure elevated during exercise. Uh, you will see that we have tested two thresholds, 60 and 50. So the flow chart is here. So abnormal exercise test, patients were referred for an intervention. Normal exercise test, still some patients were referred for prophylactic surgery, mainly patients with very severe MR. We have 10 patients that were lost or follow up and we could collect the outcome in 130 patients. In 130 patients, 23 had an abnormal exercise echo based on LV uh, function and uh, or elevated systolic pulmonary pressure. 
and uh, 107 had normal exercise test and normal exercise echo. Main results are in these slides. You can see that in patients with uh, systolic pulmonary pressure more than 60 or less than 60 at peak exercise, there is not much difference. Also, you can argue that the power was quite low, but if you use a threshold of 50, you have a nice discrimination with patient who will develop an event and patient who will remain asymptomatic. When you use uh, the systolic pulmonary pressure as a continuous uh, variable in the Cox multivariate analysis, systolic pulmonary pressure was an independent predictor of outcome. We did some subset analysis in patients with severe MR. You can see that we have exactly the same uh, discrimination with no significant difference uh, when you use the threshold of 60, significant difference when you use the threshold of 50. And we have a relatively small subset of patients with flail effect and you have exactly the same findings. So the conclusion of this study is that systolic pulmonary pressure during the exercise provide additional prognostic value in patients with asymptomatic degenerative matter regurgitation, and that the best threshold uh, to discriminate patients who will remain asymptomatic from patients who will develop indication for surgery uh, is 50. That's the main result of the studies. Thank you very much. That's great. A uh, very elegant study. And I really enjoyed it because, um, and I wanted to talk about it because there is some debate about the whole idea of exercise induced uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure as well, which we will get into. Um, so I'll let uh, Dr. Banks, Dr. Banks, would you like to help uh, us discuss this a little bit more? And if there are any questions you want to bring up for Dr. Masika Zatuin? Yeah, thank you, um, I, Dr. Masika. This was a, a very enjoyable, very easy to read uh, article, the, the kind that I really like. Uh, so I, I really congratulate you and, and the group for doing the work and uh, writing this in this way. I wanted to ask you uh, a couple of things that are in my mind as I went through the, the article, um, in particular, I thought that um, there was a significant number that at baseline uh, from, the, from the collection that had already severe MR, I think you described that in the baseline in about 138 patients. And, um, and so to me, it was a, a little bit uh, intriguing how the number that went for the prophylactic uh, surgery, the 11, that seemed kind of low. So I, I wonder what am I missing and how can I connect that with uh, one another? Okay, so if I understand correctly your, your question, you would have expected more patients with severe MR sent for prophylactic intervention. That's correct. So it, 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 in what were the reasons that um, it was so little of them in, yes. in that regard? Uh, it, it's maybe also a difference in practice between uh, Europe or at least uh, France and, uh, and the US. Uh, prophylactic intervention just based on uh, MR severity is not very common. Uh, it depends first on the skill of the surgeons and two on the anatomy. If you have a P2 flail, uh, you can send a patient for a prophylactic intervention, you, you will end up with a rate of repair of 97 or 99%. Uh, in some experience centers, not everywhere. And it's with, maybe uh, there is a little bias here is that if you are sure that you will send a patient for an intervention, you don't do the exercise test. Uh, that may explain also patients that were referred directly uh, based on severity to surgery, uh, you don't exercise them. You say that you have severe MR, you have a P2 flare, uh, right. we'll send you for a surgery, you don't do the exercise test because whatever the result of the test, you will do the intervention. It may explain why the rate was a little bit low. I, I love it. And that, that's a very candid and very honest um, uh, answer from you. That That's kind of the kind of thing that we get here in the podcast that you wouldn't get, you know, anywhere else. And uh, I, I wanted to know that there was no uh, 
post-COVID bias in, in the management. No, uh, it, it was done before COVID. <laughs> great, that's great to know too. So uh, I just uh, wanted what, what to is uh, clarify that um, question, that interesting practice difference being brought out by that question. So do, would we say that in the, in, in the US and perhaps North America, asymptomatic severe mitral regurgitation may be intervened upon uh, more frequently than in some parts of Europe? Is that what we're uh, taking away from this? Uh, it may. Um, I don't know for North America as a whole. In some centers like a Mayo Clinic uh, or Cleveland Clinic, for sure, they are very aggressive because they have very, very good surgeons. Uh, elsewhere in the US, I'm not so sure. Uh, just to mention that we are uh, in the process of starting a registry in France and in Canada, collecting all patients that, that had a mitral valve intervention in 2019. And it will be interesting to see how many patients had a prophylactic intervention and what is the success rate of repair in degenerative MR. I think we have probably an overestimation of how good is the rate of repair uh, even worldwide. In some expert centers, for sure. Uh, at the national, nationwide level, I'm not sure that we reach the 98%, 99% of repair even for a P2 flame. We'll be uh, I will come back in uh, one or two years and I will present the results. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But when we did a survey, it was based on an administrative database in France. Uh, so we were not able to collect exactly the anatomy, uh, but then based on an alg algorithm, we were able to differentiate functional to uh, organic MR. The rate of repair for primary MR in France at the nationwide, nationwide level, so all mitral valve intervention was only 70%, which was not different from what you can get in the STS database. So the rate of repair in expert centers is high at the nationwide, national, nationwide level is not that high. That's also, uh, uh, it's also uh, an incentive to do an exercise test to have more uh, incentive to do an intervention in this kind of patients. Um, thank you, Jose. I'll let you continue with your questions. All right, thank you, Amar. Uh, I too yeah, much. I, um, my other question in my mind, uh, maybe too much of morbid curiosity, but um, was there an effort after they, after you, you, you found this in a very robust way of, of the increase above fifty? Um, was there maybe an effort to go back to those patients and, and ask if they're really asymptomatic, uh, kind of a good uh, fellow project uh, to, to, to try to get answers from those patients a more, in a more uh, intimate way? Uh, no, it's a good question. Uh, first, uh, to answer quickly, uh, no, we didn't. Uh, but uh, patients were referred by their uh, referral cardiologist with a diagnosis of being asymptomatic. Uh, before starting the exercise, of course, we ask a few questions to be sure that we are not exercising somebody with obvious symptoms. Uh, so no. Uh, assessment of symptoms is not always easy. It's different here from uh, AS population because they are significantly younger, but still a uh, patient can get uh, used to their symptoms or uh, minimizing symptoms. Uh, that's why an exercise test is very important when you can do it. Uh, but we haven't uh, been able to go back to the patient and see if you are truly asymptomatic. Right. Thank you um, for that. I also, um, I only have a couple more questions. I, um, you know, there, there is a, uh, a very nice editorial written about this work, and I uh, I read that too uh, in detail. Uh, they, there's mention by the uh, um, authors of the manuscript about the the different um, uh, patterns on the um, on the evaluation. They also they mentioned the two patterns of the the plateau uh, and the takeoff patterns. And I know in your study, they looked at it only baseline and peak. Um, I wonder if 
what is your thought about, about the pattern having a, a value or a significance and, and perhaps the, the difficulty of implementing something like that um, and the value on top of that of, of, uh, of good evaluation of, of baseline RB function, which, which in most labs is, is, is actually uh, a, a, not, a not trivial challenge. No, I agree. Um, I think the, um, it's an important point. The slope or how fast you increase your systolic primary pressure, uh, I'm sure should provide some prognostic value. It was not evaluated in that study. We just look at the peak. Uh, we have looked at the slope of increasing of systolic primary pressure in, in the study on mitral stenosis, but not on that one. Uh, it's likely that if not the same, that if your systolic primary pressure is 60 or 50, at 20 watts or it's uh, at 120, uh, but we need to uh, analyze that more carefully. We haven't done that yet. Uh, regarding right ventricular function, yes, it's challenging for everybody. We use uh, uh, SL, uh, DTI and the TAPS like everybody. Um, uh, most of the time it's visual assessment as well. So we haven't looked at uh, relationship between the increase in systolic primary pressure and right ventricular function. But most of them had normal right ventricular function at rest. Yeah. That's what you expect with the asymptomatic uh, MR. Right. The, um, the last question, um, Dr. Messica, was the, the surprise about the finding above 60 not really uh, meeting the criteria or, or looking at that uh, with a with the outcome, um, I was um, I was surprised by that. I, I I do like the fact, obviously, that that the fifty cutoff was so significant. Uh, and uh, just like uh, mentioned in the um, in the editorial uh, about the 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 sixty um, not not crossing that significance value. And, and perhaps the reason with your population being significantly younger, but I, I wanted to hear from you, you know, the, the author about, about, that, um, about that particular difference and the findings. So first, the systolic primary pressure as a continuous variable was uh, an independent prognostic factor. When we look at 60, which was in the previous guideline, we find no uh, significant difference. So we did a rock curve and find that the 50 was the best threshold. Uh, the lack of difference uh, at 60 is probably because the sample size is smaller. You have some uh, divergence in the curve. But the main uh, explanation for me is that the prognostic uh, impact of systolic primary pressure start earlier, already around 50. And some of patients that are between 50 and 60 here, you see, already develop symptoms. So uh, the highest systolic primary pressure you have the more uh, event you will uh, develop, but you start, the systolic primary pressure start to impact outcome when you reach 50. And um, I lied, one last question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also read uh, that you guys chose the RA pressure to be yes. uniformly 10 on everybody, uh, baseline and then a peak. And, and that makes sense if you're going to make it uniformly and, and you have relatively young patients. Uh, do you think it would have been uh, significantly different if you go by the IVC criteria? No. Uh, first, uh, doing the IVC criteria during exercise would be very challenging. Uh, so almost impossible uh, if you have to press on the, the abdomen uh, during uh, the biking. No, but uh, at baseline, the resting, I mean. Oh, rest, no, and when we uh, use only the TR velocity, we find no difference. So I don't think the right uh, arterial pressure will make any difference. Right. So you can use the systolic primary pressure, uh, 50, or you could use a TR velocity at 40. Right. It's uh, basically the same. OK. Well, thank you. Uh, just one word on the study itself. It's retrospective. Uh, with limitation of all retrospective studies, uh, would be good to develop something prospectively now and to further validate that. We need more data. Uh, I think our uh, studies is in favor of doing that, but we need to push that further and doing more exercise tests in uh, exercise echo in this kind of patient 
and uh, formally validate prospectively that systolic pulmonary pressure provide uh, independent prognostic value. That's great. That's great, thank you. Um, I have a couple of very quick questions. So I just wanted to clarify that your group at rest did not have significant pulmonary hypertension. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I don't remember and the the rest uh, systolic pulmonary pressure was thirty two. Okay, great. And then my other question is, um, can you clarify? And I, I think you already answered that uh, in response to Dr. Banks' previous question. But what is the significance of a delta value as opposed to the absolute cutoff of 50 millimeters mercury threshold? Um, could someone still have a significant delta, but still be below 50? What is the um, significance of that in your mind? Um, the delta did not provide a better prognostic value than just the peak. Uh, again, as everybody has almost around 30, 35, uh, the delta was very uh, close to the peak. Uh, it was If you use the peak or the delta, you don't find much difference because everybody has normal uh, systolic primary pressure at rest. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you for clarifying that. And, um, you know, as you know, with respect to the last pulmonary hypertension guidelines, there's a black box around the idea of exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension. And some of this work is suggesting we need to revisit that. And as you mentioned, do some more prospective work. Can you comment on that? Do you think exercise-induced pH is an important um, idea? Uh, or is it only specific to certain conditions such as mitral valve disease? Uh, in, to answer specifically on valvular heart disease, uh, we did a similar study on AS and did not find, we did not find that uh, systolic primary pressure provide uh, prognostic information in patients with AS, uh, but uh, mean age was 75, so much older, uh, you may have diastolic dysfunction. So uh, it may be associated with prognosis, but in AS, it was not related to AS-related events. Okay. Um, I would not say that uh, systolic pulmonary pressure is not important because uh, <laughs> the study is showing the opposite. Uh, uh, if you look at, there is one publication from uh, another group in France showing that in some normal subject, you can also develop uh, systolic pulmonary pressure during exercise. Yeah, uh, even if you have, you are, it was healthy volunteers. Uh, that's right. And that's why I think um, it's not clear on whether it's a real entity or not, right? Yeah. Uh, but so that's great. I think it goes to your point that more work needs to be done um, in, in this area. Now, what can labs take away from this paper? So if, uh, if a patient has mitral regurgitation is asymptomatic, is sitting on the fence, should we do an exercise test and see if they're going above 50 uh, and decide on whether they need an intervention? Can we take that away from this paper yet? Or do you think more work needs to be done before that uh, can be implemented? First, I think if you have severe asymptomatic MI, you need to have an exercise test. It could be a simple exercise test, could be a VO2 max, or can be a CPOT, or it can be a, an exercise echo, but you need to exercise this patient. For exercise echo, our study is in favor. Uh, again, it's a retrospective study. So I would not probably send a patient only based on that, but if the patient had very severe MR and uh, you have uh, elevated systolic pulmonary pressure, and his uh, likelihood of repair is high, uh, it, I would push my patient to get surgery. So it's maybe not only on that, but uh, um, with a conjunction of other factors, uh, I would do it. Another Especially piece, if you had piece of the, an, Yeah, another piece of the puzzle. And as, as we've mentioned previously in this podcast, you, you don't hang your hat on a single value. I think is what you're what you're trying to get at. So looking at the whole context of the patient. So 
That's great. Thank you very much. I think that summarizes the paper really well. And I encourage our listeners to download the paper from the September 2021 issue of the Journal of American Society of ECHO to really uh, delve into more of the data and the nuances presented by this group. So that's great. So thank you to both of you for going through this paper. Um, now we're going to uh, find out a little bit more about our uh, current presenters. I'm trying to introduce a little bit of steam into my science-based activities. And as we end here today with the final episode of the JACE podcast for the summer series, uh, I want to find out a little bit more from Dr. Banks. Dr. Banks, can you tell us a little bit about your interest in art, um, what would you like to share with us? Um, I love art. <laughs> <laughs> and I have been, uh, um, I guess, getting known for uh, my collection. And uh, just so happens that since I'm moving, I, I'm right next to stuff that I'm about to hang back here. And I'm going to brag a little bit. I have, look at this. Uh, a painting from my niece, uh, one of my nieces, she painted a heart uh, so well. And uh, wow. out of the arteries, it made it into real tree branches. So I'm, I'm very excited to- That uh, is beautiful. Yeah. And uh, I have a colleague from MD Anderson, Dr. David Rice, who's a, who's a painter too. Uh, you know, many surgeons are very visual and have a big talent about illustrating. And uh, this, I, I actually bought it from him. It, he doesn't even know that I bought it at an auction, but uh, it's a uh, ASD repair. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging this one too. I'm really a big fan of the, you know, the classic illustration kind of live looks of them. Yeah, but- That's Incredible. Um, so you bought that uh, from him or at a separate auction? No, there, there was a, in, in the U, UT had a, a faculty sort of meeting and, uh, you know, they had a lot of things to do. And one of them was uh, a silent auction of, of, of art produced by the physicians. And uh, that really caught my eye. So I was very happy to, to have it. That's amazing. And we've, we've heard uh, that there is an interest amongst many of our colleagues in ASC. So maybe maybe some ideas for an event, an arts related event in the future. So definitely. And doc, uh, Dr. Masika Zatun, tell us you, you, you're, you're from one of the cities that is the heart of artistic history. So tell us uh, about your interest and so, um, uh, what, uh, what you like. I, I love painting as well. Uh, I did one year of training and uh, I was not very skilled, but uh, I need to go back and, uh, and do some more. Uh, I love movies as well, old movies uh, okay. uh, from uh, 20, 1920 or up to 160. Basically. Can you recommend something for us to look at? Oh, one, uh, one very good. One of my favorite is uh, Gentleman Jim uh, with Errol Flynn. It's about uh, the story of boxing. It's okay. an amaz amazing movie. Cool. Okay, gentlemen, Jim. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you for enriching us with your interests and um, the, the some of the color that you brought to this podcast. And uh, I want to thank you again for uh, joining us. And uh, what I'll do is end there and thank my audience for joining us for the for this summer series. Moving forward, we'll probably do one podcast per month and select an article. And I hope that some of our guests will be able to join us uh, moving forward. So thank you. I know it's going to be, be a busy September and fall for everyone. So we're going to be ending the podcast there. So thank you, Dr. Banks. And thank you, Dr. Mr. Bezos, for joining us. Thank you so much.